City Public Library. I'm Henry Fortunato, Director of Public Affairs. And uh, tonight we are uh, participating in the City of Fountain celebration and uh, also marking a, a major milestone, a major step forward in our partnership with the Kansas City Symphony, uh, which has very graciously brought us this program, uh, which we'll hear more about momentarily. Um, I want to tell you one personal story, though, about um, Paul Benson, uh, the featured speaker tonight and the associate curator of objects at the Nelson Atkins Museum. Um, many of you know Paul as, as, as a longtime Nelson Atkins guy. Um, at my family, though, uh, we think of him as um, the guy who taught my sons how to clean tombstones. I kid you not, uh, among Paul's uh, many other accomplishments, um, he is a major volunteer at uh, Elmwood Cemetery. And about uh, two years ago, my uh, elder son uh, was working on his Eagle Scout project, which entailed uh, resetting about a dozen or so tombstones of Civil War veterans. So uh, my older son, who was 17 at the time, uh, did the heavy lifting with the older boys in the scout troop. My younger son, who was about, uh, I don't know, 11 or 12 at the time, so a brand new scout, and the younger boys, it was their job. They were the bucket brigade. And Paul taught them how to clean tombstones. And the answer is liquid ivory soap dishwashing detergent. <laughs> if you ever have to clean a tombstone, now you know what to do. Well, now I really do want to bring on um, Frank Byrne, the executive director of the Kansas City Symphony. He's been director for 11 years. Um, and uh, as we were talking earlier, this, is, this marks a, a serious major collaboration for us. We're very happy to have him and the symphony here. So please welcome Frank Byrne. Thank you, Henry. We are here tonight as part of a year-long celebration that we've developed at the symphony about the identity of our hometown as the city of fountains. When Michael Stern and I began preparing this inaugural season in Hellsburg Hall at the Kaufman Center, we tried to think, oh, we can clap around that. Anyone want to clap? <laughs> we began thinking about commissioning new music and a theme that could carry on throughout the season. Uh, in 1913, uh, Nearly a century ago now, Ottorino Respighi, very well-known, very gifted Italian composer, wrote a piece called The Fountains of Rome. And he based this piece on four different fountains in Rome at different times of the day. And I thought, since we're the city of fountains, we could do as well or better. So in the course of our season, we are giving world premieres of three new works that are inspired by the fountains of Kansas City. At our opening weekend, we did a work by Kansas City's own Chen Yi called Fountains of KC. And we will perform a work in June by Stephen Hartke called The Muse of the Missouri, based on the fountain of that name. And this weekend, we're giving the world premiere of a work by Daniel Kellogg, who is with us tonight, called Water Music. And when we first talked to Dan about doing this commission, uh, we talked about all the variety of fountains and the different ways in which the movement of water is expressed in fountains around town. He came to town and he and I did a whirlwind tour of a number of fountains and based on that inspiration he has developed this work which we've begun rehearsing in the past two days and will give the world premiere tomorrow night and it will also be performed Saturday and Sunday. Now we could not have the entire orchestra here tonight but we are going to give you a sample of a work of Dan's chamber music. But first, I wanted to invite him to come up and talk to you for a couple of minutes about the work he has done to develop this new piece, Water Music. Please welcome our composer, Daniel Kellogg. It's a real pleasure to be with you. I hail from just outside of Boulder, Colorado, where I teach at the University of Colorado. And it's quite interesting because although it's maybe a nine hour drive, I feel like we're neighbor cities in this part of the world. Um, it's an incredible pleasure to be here this week to work with the symphony. This is a remarkably good orchestra. They're just fantastic. And to be invited, yeah, to, to be invited to create a new piece to help celebrate this amazing hall is 
It's really an honor, and it's, uh, it's absolutely a thrill, and it's one of the most exciting premieres that I've ever been involved with, the energy around working with these fine musicians and uh, bringing a piece to life in, in such an extraordinary place is just, um, it's, it's really a highlight for me as a creative composer. Uh, just a couple of words about the piece. It is called water music. That's a term that has worked in the past, so I thought I would resurrect it and uh, call the piece that. It is inspired by three fountains that on that whirlwind day when I got to see all the various fountains, there were three that sort of spoke to me as a trio that I thought could create the inspiration for a piece. And the three fountains, um, the first one is the J.C. Nichols Memorial Fountain, which I believe is just right across the way from us. The second is the Muse of the Missouri, which also has inspired uh, Mr. Harkey. And then the last one is the fountain at the um, Union um, Station, which uh, was it? I wrote it down. The right Henry Woolman Block Fountain, and the first fountain, the J.C. Nichols. I titled the first movement "Battling Torrents" because it's a fountain that's filled with wild energy. The images of these horses on end, and there's they're battling with alligators and bears, and there's violence, and at the same time there are these cherubs riding uh, fish, and of course then there's the simple beauty of the play of water. Um, that erupts all over the, from the fountain. And I just thought it was filled with this wonderful sort of dichotomy of energy. So it's a movement of sort of fierce battling and at the same time, hopefully, uh, some, some glorious beauty. The second movement, so that's a very fast movement. And actually, the main part of it is a scherzo. The second movement, the Muse of the Missouri sort of actually steps back and takes its inspiration from just the idea of the, of the muse of, of water and this city being founded on the intersection of two cities and just sort of what what is water meant for this city and what does water mean in general as it passes through time and and uh, all the different ways that it uh, intersects with our lives so this movement is a much more contemplative um, sort of looking back through the ages about uh, water and and just the whole concept of a muse and what it's what it means for artists what it means um, you know the the greek muses the last movement um, is called Cascades. And I think my favorite fountain was the fountain in front of the train station because it is a continual play of water, um, a continual play of brilliant designs. And I think I read that it takes something like 50 minutes or so forth for the pattern to actually repeat. So that as you would sit there and watch it over a few minutes, you would never be able to predict what's going to happen. The way that all of those different um, different jets of water would play with each other. So it's a very fast movement filled with life and color and hopefully some surprising turns. So these three movements uh, form water music and my sort of response to these beautiful fountains. So that's a word about the piece. I hope you can come out. It really is a thrill for me and hopefully a thrill for the orchestra to bring a new piece to life and I'm delighted to be part of this project. It's a real pleasure to be here and to share some music with you. So I hope you enjoy. Now, we're going to learn more about how fountains work and how they are maintained. Our speaker is Paul Benson, who is Associate Curator of Objects at the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art. He has been on the staff at the Nelson since 1992, and look forward to hearing from him about some of the parts of fountains that we don't normally see or know about. Please welcome Mr. Paul Benson. As you know, Kansas City is the city of fountains. And we don't know exactly how many fountains we have here. The number is a neighborhood of 200. Uh, there's probably more than that. Uh, not all of them are working, of course. A lot of times a fountain can still be called a fountain and many, many years after it stopped working as a fountain. Now that doesn't seem to make a difference. As long as we count them as uh, more than Rome, that's good enough. <laughs> fountains have a variety of uses uh, and purposes why they were created. Uh, they can be as a, as a memorial. This is a firefighter's memorial fountain. Uh, they might even want to inspire people to buy a new car. Uh, you, you just never know how they're going to be used. But uh, tonight we'll look at some of the ones around town, some of the ones you're familiar with, some of the ones you may not be familiar with. Uh, I will say right offhand that uh, we're, all the music lovers in Kansas City are probably very grateful that Mr. Kellogg did not take a tour of the mechanical rooms of some of these fountains, or the music may have turned out a little bit differently, but uh, we'll see. Fountains come in a variety of sizes and shapes. Uh, some of them are just water jets, like the block fountain. 
Some of them have a sculptural element in them uh, surrounded by water. Now, some of them have a sculptural element where the water actually comes out of them. Now, this, of course, is a Bacchus fountain made out of lead in the plaza. And just as an aside, since I am a conservator, I do not advise you to buy lead sculptures or lead fountains. Uh, the squirrels here in Kansas City love to chew on lead. And uh, they have ruined many a piece outside, so please don't buy anything made out of lead. Sometimes a fountain could just be so simply a pile of rocks you know, with water running over them. And it can be something just as simple as a, similar to a drinking fountain or a trough. But the one thing they all have in common, obviously, is water. And water is the number one enemy of fountains. If, if, if we could get rid of the water, the fountains would be perfect. They would all look very nice. So I would be out of a job. But uh, I, I think the aesthetics of around town would be much improved. But no, what does water do? No, water corrodes metals. Water erodes stone. Water promotes the growth of org organic material. Now, as you can see in this particular fountain, now, this is all organic growth here, and it's all because of the water. Now, water has to be controlled in a certain way. Uh, you, want, you don't want minerals, too many minerals in the water. You don't want too few of minerals in the water. Now, it's, it, there's a real balance, and it's a real science to get the water balanced correctly. One the thing that uh, is another enemy of fountains, but primarily of water, are these things. <laughs> People and animals are attracted to water. And you can't have water which, is, which will not have organic growth in it and still expect it to be safe for human and animals. So again, there's a real balance between these. Uh, I'm working on fountains for a long time, and everybody that walks a dog, the dog will always come up there and drink out of it. Uh, people just assume that the water is safe. It isn't necessarily safe. Uh, there have been some fountains that had so much chlorine in them, you can actually smell them as you drive by. And I certainly don't even want to put my hands in that, let alone let an animal drink out of it. But uh, as I didn't say, it's, it's a tough balancing act. This is what happens to the stone when uh, the, the water balance is not correct. You get a lot of organic growth on it. Uh, this can be cleaned away. It's not permanent. Uh, sometimes it can stay on the surface and make a dark stain, but generally it can be removed, but it's much better if it's not there to start with. We'll talk about some specific fountains uh, for a little while. I think you're all familiar with, with this one. You've seen it a hundred times. But um, maybe some of the things that you don't know about this fountain is that when it came to Kansas City, it was not complete. There were a few pieces missing. Uh, they hired a local artist here in town to complete this fountain. And one of the things that were missing were a couple of heads from the little the <laughs> puti or cherubs. You can see the, the braze line on this. This is a new head on an old body. But one of the things you may not be aware of is that there was a complete piece missing from the fountain. That one, that is a brand new piece that was created once the fountain arrived in Kansas City. Well, just so happened um, probably three years ago or so, I'm gonna guess, the Parks and Recreation folks were contacted by a man in Florida who was gonna put a piece of a fountain up for auction, but he wondered if, they, if Kansas City would be interested in purchasing it before it went to auction, because it just so happens this was an original piece from this fountain when it was installed at a mansion back east. And there it is. Yes, it looks quite a bit different, doesn't it? And that's the, that's the replacement, and that's the original. And then this piece was purchased um, by the city and with some private funds brought to Kansas City. And eventually it will be installed in the fountain, but you can see a problem right off the bat. It doesn't match at all, does it? Now, it has a completely different surface to it. And that's part of the, part of the, the problem. Uh, how are we going to make these match? How are they going to integrate these? And that's a little bit uh, problematic of why it's taking so long to do this. It's also, a, it's a, you can tell the difference in the sculptural quality of these pieces. If you look at the musculature, particularly the arms of this piece and the face on him, Compared to that, uh, so you can see that the, the fountain originally was a lot more dynamic and did have a, a much greater sculptural quality to it. 
Um, I think when, you, when it is integrated in with the rest of it, I think people will be very surprised. Then the question remains, and what do you do with the piece, the replacement piece? Can that be a fountain on its own? That hasn't been decided yet either, but that is a question that will have to be thought about. There it is, there's our friend of Missouri, Musa, Missouri rather. Uh, this is what it looked like uh, back in 1997 before conservation treatment was begun on it. Uh, the white streaks that you see here are calcium deposits, uh, calcium um, from the water, this hard water here in Kansas City. Um, this piece had been treated uh, many years ago when nothing had been done for a long time, so it wasn't in particularly good shape. Uh, part of the problem with getting to it and why it hadn't been maintained was because it was so difficult to actually then get close to it. Uh, it's at the 8th, between 8th and 9th on Main Street. It's just a small traffic island. Uh, scaffolding had to be erected around this whenever you had to do anything to it. Um, it's not a particularly great part of town. Uh, scaffolding people were worried about their scaffolding still being there the next morning <laughs> with uh, the price of scrap metal being uh, as high as it is now. So uh, insurance purposes, uh, you have to think twice about uh, how often you're going to work on this. Well, this project was actually done by one of my colleagues, Joe Rogers, at the museum. And this is just showing you, showing you a couple of the steps of what's involved in working on a piece of bronze. Part of the problem with this is all this calcium deposit on here was so hard that he couldn't get to the metal surface because of all the calcium. There was a coating on the surface, and usually we take off all these old coatings before we apply a new coating, but he just couldn't even, he couldn't even get to it. The, the chemicals wouldn't even eat through it. So basically he had to sand this entire sculpture to get the calcium loosened up enough so that the chemicals would work on the coating. Uh, it's a major job, and uh, he did uh, subcontract quite a few of us to come out and help every now and then. And, uh, he wasn't going to get it by, done by himself, I can tell you that. Well, this is the way it turned out. As you can see, uh, again, the pictures aren't very good, unfortunately, shooting into the sun. But that was in 1997, and this is what it looks like today. The part where the water does not contact the sculpture still looks like it's in pretty good shape. It has a nice gloss to it. The, f the surface on it looks like it's in pretty good shape. But the rest of it, where our good old friend the water hits, we have rust stains, we have streaks now, more rust stains down here. You can see the same thing on this other image over here. Uh, it is something that people don't realize that sculptures and fountains cannot just be put outside and expect to take care of themselves. Now, you, you think of bronze outside. Bronze has been around for a thousand years, two thousand years but it has to be taken care of. You can't just put it outside and expect it to look all right. So this is part of the problem with this particular piece. Uh, some of the other things, um, getting a little closer into it now, the bottom two images are actually down in the mechanical room of, the, of this sculpture, someplace Mr. Kellogg did not see, luckily. And this is very, this is very typical. Uh, mechanical rooms, by nature, have to be hidden uh, for aesthetic reasons. You can't have a room right beside your sculpture full of electrical panels and pumps and valves and drains. So th then the water is naturally going to seep into them. Now, it starts to rust out the equipment. In this particular case, this plastic is over the electrical panel. Uh, again, electric and uh, water don't really go very well together. Uh, but it's just, it's very typical, and this is, I'm, this is not a criticism, I'm just telling you this is the way it is. And that's why you see a lot of rust up on the surface. When you have rusty pipes underneath, the water going through there is picking up that rust and it's going to deposit it out on the surface. So um, I guess it, it does pay to use stainless steel and plastic, but you do have to remember even stainless steel will corrode over time and there are something like 50 different varieties of stainless steel so even though someone may tell you oh yes it's all plumbed with stainless steel if it's not the right one you're still going to have problems also with this you've got some of the cladding coming off and it's just showing you that they it costs a lot of money to maintain our 200 plus sculptures here in town yes fountains rather this is our women's leadership fountain. Now, this is the oldest working 
fountain here in Kansas City. Now it hasn't been continuously working since 1899. It's had uh, stops and starts, uh, but this is what it looks like today after a major restoration work on it. This is what it looked like before. Sorry. If you notice, the balustrades are all gone. The starting to cave in around here. It's leaking. Steps are in poor condition. And this is what it looks like now. So it's, they've, this is all done by the city. And I think they've done a remarkable job on that. There is no sculptural element to this fountain, but it is important. Uh, this has been adopted now. The Women's Leadership Fountain is not, was not its original name, but the name has, been, has evolved now from some of the people who are sponsoring this fountain. This one I think you've seen, the American War Mothers Memorial Fountain in the Meyer in the Paseo. Again, it was in uh, fairly tough shape. Um, again, it been right in the middle of a major intersection, so there was a lot of uh, problems going on. But uh, it's made of stone. There are some bronze elements where the water spots are located. There are some enamel pieces on uh, each side of this. And this is a picture of it afterwards, after it had been uh, fully restored. This was the first piece that uh, Kansas City considered a kind of a pilot project to see if they could get fountains to pay for themselves. Now, could there be a dual use, a dual purpose for these fountains to actually bring in little money, maybe to help maintain this or to help generate funds for the restoration of some of the other fountains? Well, the ideas went out uh, and went out to the, this, the city. Maybe you folks didn't hear about this, but uh, some people did. So this was the first idea that they came up with. How about the American War Mother's Car Wash? Well, it seemed like a pretty reasonable idea that the water squirting out of it can certainly wash your car down. And um, this really did this opened about three weeks, I think, after the the piece was was conserved. Unfortunately, it didn't have the, the entrance wasn't open yet, uh, so we felt this was probably a problem. Uh, the exit wasn't open yet either. And it's going to take two uh, wreckers to get this vehicle out of the car wash. Well. As you may have guessed, the project didn't go any further than this. Uh, and I figured this, this probably wasn't a real good idea, so they put a stop to it. I, I don't know why. Another interesting um, material used for a fountain that you don't see very often is a terrazzo type material, concrete and marble chips. This is Adam and Eve in Loose Park. Uh, two very popular pieces. You can see how the water kind of bubbles out of a little bowl in their hands. One of the more interesting things about this, this was created back in 1942. The internal armature on this was aluminum, uh, which actually is the only one I've ever run into that had an, an aluminum armature. Usually they're, um, they're steel. And so I don't know whether this, this was done during the wartime. I don't know whether steel was in short supply so they used aluminum, or this was just something high tech that the artist thought of. I'm, I don't know, but uh, it, it's actually very interesting. And it actually helped uh, preserve the sculpture because the aluminum does not expand when it oxidizes like steel does. These are just some of them, uh, before and after pictures of what's go going on with it. Um, you can see his nose starting to erode. It has been repaired fairly recently. You've got cracks in the arm which have been fixed. And the reason why this has to be done is obviously water will get inside there. Water does expand when it freezes and all it's going to do is just tear this thing apart eventually. If this had an iron armature in it, iron has what's called a, a, a molar volume. Uh, when it rusts, the molar volume actually increases. So a lot of pieces with an armature internally will actually break apart from the inside before you can even see it on the surface. So in this particular case, we're very lucky that the in internally it was just fine. Very interesting project here. This is a Romanelli fountain. This is actually in Armour Fields. And this is a travertine the sculptural element in this fountain. The travertine is a type of limestone, but it's much softer than most limestones. This had a, the water element here came out the top of the bird's head, which is now missing. Say so this has been there for, uh, and when this picture was taken, approximately 75 years. You can see the, um, the extent of the erosion on this piece. Um, and this detail over here, 
the wings are deteriorated, the uh, legs are missing, arms are missing, and there's a lot of organic growth on this piece. And the question was, so did, what can you do with this? Well, the Homeowners Association decided to have this piece recreated. They wanted to bring this fountain back to the way it looked approximately in 1925. I think that was a very noble idea, them wanting to do this. But the question was, how can it be done? Well, well, we'll just look at a few more details on this also. You can see that it is so badly eroded, it's really hard to even tell what you're looking at anymore. The faces have, are basically gone, et cetera, et cetera. Well, the first thing that had to be done was to take this thing completely apart and get it inside where we could work on it. To take it apart, I went in there and chiseled out the mortar between all the different pieces and then drove wooden wedges in all the way around, increasingly larger wedges until the pieces were separated enough that the crane folks could actually get their straps in there. Now, once they took it all apart, they took it down to a studio they had rented down on 31st Street, and that's where the real work began. Well, this is what the two artists decided to create. Now, this is a very unusual project in as, in as much as that they did not recreate this in stone, but in bronze. So it will not look the same as what the artist had in mind originally, but it's going to be very permanent. And what you're looking at here is their clay model of what they created. They took uh, their, um, their references from original photos, which were actually very poor, and by looking at the evidence of what was left the, on, the, on this element. And one thing that I um, would like to emphasize is that they did not create anything new from this. They based everything that they did on images and, and from their investigations. They even went so far as to duplicate a mistake that the artist made originally. Uh, the artist um, made a small mistake on one of the hands, only putting in two fingers on a hand, and instead of making them anatomically correct, they actually just duplicated that, so one figure just has two fingers on the one hand. Uh, but now they've also created uh, the rest of the, the bird, so now you know it's a goose these boys are wrestling with. And I saw this when they first created it. It was actually too good. They actually did too good a job on this. The, the piece looked like it was brand new. And that was one thing when you tried to balance out the aesthetics of the piece. You didn't want it to look too new, but you didn't want it to look so old that it just mimicked the original piece. So they actually had to go in and round some of their, their carving on, down a little bit to, to make it look appropriate. And there they are, it's a Moretta Kennedy and Robert Ojeda, and they might actually be here tonight. Uh, are, are you out there? Oh, that's too bad. I'd say they, they do need a shout out for this. It was a marvelous job. And you can see the, the comparison there between their clay model, what it looks like now, and what the original looked like. And there's the bronze actually on site now. Um, so this, this is what that would have looked like originally. You see the, sculpt, the fountain has changed. It's not true to exactly what they had in mind, but it will be, be preserved for the future now. And they even went so far as to um, place in here a little inscription telling you who the original artist was, why this is a reproduction, their names, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not trying to fool anybody. And also then uh, what do you do with this piece? It's no longer being used, it's no longer out there. Well, the Homeowners Association just put it in the corner of the little park there. Now, there was nothing else to do with it. Uh, now people can actually see what the original looked like and the new piece. I think that was a very good solution to, them, to this. This is our seahorse fountain uh, with some pink water coming up out of it. I think, uh, I think we've all seen this. Uh, we were very big on dyeing the fountains here in Kansas City for the opening of the chief season, uh, baseball season, uh, cancer awareness month. Uh, it's done quite often. Uh, it is inspirational to people, whether, you get, whether it makes you want to attend a sporting event or contribute to a charity. Well, the, what's interesting in this picture, when you see it, all the times that this fountain has been dyed, the stonework has not absorbed any of the color. Uh, this dye is actually made by a company here in town called Blue Valley Labs, 
who has a proprietary die that uh, they will not tell you about, um, no matter how, how badly you try. Um, but it, it's, it will not affect the stonework, which I think is uh, remarkable. But that wasn't me bumping something. But uh, see, as far as inspiration goes on this, sometimes people get so inspired by, this, by these that they think, let's just do it ourselves. We don't need to, somebody to come in here and show us how to dye a fountain. All right, here's a marble fountain in Colonial Court in Mission Hills that someone decided they thought it should look better with the blue water in it, but they did not use the dye that uh, the city uses. Yes, um, I don't know what it was, so we've never been able to figure out what it was, but this is what it did look like afterwards. Uh, it is not an easy process to get that dye back out of there. This is what has to be done. Uh, there was actually three fountains were, were dyed blue and purple uh, in Mission Hills that particular year. In this case, uh, this is one, this is another one. This is a um, Brookwood and State Line. We actually had to make a poultice out of a material. It's called Fuller's Earth. It's a magnesium aluminum silicate mixed with talc and uh, quartz with a special chemical in it. Uh, you mix these two together and it actually looks like mud and you basically throw it onto the surface. It has to be in very good contact with the surface. It's a poultice and the chemical and, and the drawing power of the Fuller's Earth will actually pull this color out of the fountain. It has to be wrapped up and with the cling film, you can see there, taped on for about 24 hours to let it do its thing. So we can do it so it doesn't dry out so fast. And then once, it, once it's, it's been there for 24 hours, you pull off the cling film, you let it dry, you crash just like mud, and lo and behold, you, end, you do end up getting the color out. And this is what, what we're looking at here. This is after the color has been, been removed. Uh, it was interesting. This was done right before Mission Hills was putting their covers on for the winter. And I was actually out there scraping off the last little bit of it as cars are going by with their headlights. That was the only way I could really see what I was doing that night, uh, trying to beat the, the deadline. This is a fountain uh, that's going to be highlighted in the Fountain Day on April 10th to Marlboro Plaza Fountain. It's marble, 79th and the Paseo. And what's interesting about this one is this plastic water line here. Uh, most fountains are not done that way. Uh, there's, uh, this is obviously a replacement, but what's even more interesting about this is this material. Can you see this? It looks very rough through here. That's actually redeposited calcium. Um, again, when the water, there are hard water here in Kansas City has calcium in it. When this water goes through marble, marble is calcium carbonate. It picks up more calcium, and when it finally reaches a point where the water is saturated, it actually starts depositing that calcium back out onto the surface of the stone. And that redeposited material is actually harder than the stone itself, and very disfiguring, as you can see here. Uh, it's very difficult to get off. Um, you can't take it off with, a, say, an acid. Um, calcium carbonate reacts very nicely with a dilute hydrochloric acid, but you can't take it off that way because you can't control it. You'd be dissolving away the fountain at the same time. So the only way to get it off is mechanically. Well, there was a company here in town, uh, Carthage Marble, and the fountain was taken down to them and they were able to get that off of there. Um, I'm not sure exactly yet. Uh, there were some grinding tools beside the piece, so I'm assuming it was all done with some very mm, slow grinding, a lot of patience. But actually, I think it turned out very nicely. And again, this is why water is so bad in fountains. <laughs> it creates a lot of work for a lot of people, and it just isn't necessary, unless you want a fountain, of course. <laughs> and here's water, our good friend water again. This was an April surprise. Uh, in 2008, once the fountains had all been turned on for Fountain Day, we had a nice little snowstorm roll in. As you can see, it was cold enough to freeze the water. Uh, you know what happens to water when it freezes, it expands. 
and any kind of little cracks that it can get into, it will get into it, there's no doubt about it. And that's what happened to the, to the seahorse fountain. Uh, this was, there was a pre-existing crack uh, that just didn't happen immediately. This uh, took a little while for this to, to occur, but the weight of the ice on there and the expansion and the contraction of the water in there eventually cracked this piece right off and broke away. But it has been repaired. So there it is again. Uh, this, this, fun, this poor fountain has suffered a lot. Uh, those of you that have lived here for several years, I'm sure, uh, know some of the stories of this. Uh, I've had a man tell me he knew of kids who would actually throw a rope around the figure on top and drag it off. Uh, the basins have been pulled off, they've been replaced, uh, a lot of the stone has been donated. So th th this has had a tough life, but it is a very, very popular piece. Now, we were talking about ivory liquid a little, a little earlier. Well, this uh, figure is not floating in uh, a nice bed of snow, this is foam. I think you've all seen it, uh, everybody thinks it's funny. You drive by a fountain, you see the, the suds coming out, it looks good. Now you think, yeah, that's, that, everybody's having a little fun with this. This is actually very harmful to the mechanical parts of the fountain. It isn't damaging to the sculptural elements at all, but uh, this can cause several thousand dollars worth of damage to the mechanical parts of it. Uh, what happens, the soap can dry out the seals and the pumps, and then when they dry out, everything starts to leak, and the pumps burn out, they have to be replaced, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, save your ivory liquid for cleaning the tombstones, not for dumping into the fountains, please. We're going to end it here on this one, uh, showing you some good and bad practice of what you can do with your fountains during the wintertime. This is a fountain in Prairie Village. It's, made, it's stone with some bronze elements, and they didn't know what to do with it. They thought it was a good idea to cover it. Well, unfortunately, that's, that type of cover really isn't doing any good whatsoever. The condensation is forming inside the tent. It's sitting on the surface of the stone and the bronze. And actually, water sitting on the surface will do more corrosive damage than water running on a surface. So this is what we don't want to see. We don't want to see, see this done in this way. The other sample you see over here is actually from Mission Hills where they've done it the way that it should be done. This is a tent that has ventilation on all four sides. There's nothing in contact at all with the, with the stone. Uh, so it, it's drying out, it's not getting wet. Uh, there's no freeze-thaw cycle going on inside here. So I think that's actually a, a very good solution to it. Um, this is kind of an interesting aside. We had a very similar piece like this at the, at the Nelson where we put a cover over it for the winter time. But we'd also put a cover over the, it wasn't a fountain, it was a sculpture, but we actually put a little rack inside the sculpture so people wouldn't climb up and go inside. We we're afraid of maybe kids climbing up, going inside and not being able to get out. So we put a little cover over the top of it. Well, when we went to take the cover off of this, uh, we found there had been a homeless person living inside there for the winter time. <laughs> So I don't know if Mission Hills gets a surprise when they open up their, their, their sculptures or not. Uh, I can't imagine homeless in Mission Hills, of course, but, but, but who knows. Well, that's, that's the end of the, the presentation. I will take some question and answers if anybody, well, I'm going to take answers, I'll take questions. <laughs>